Hello. All right. Uh, so I, I actually gave a, a talk earlier this year that was uh, fairly pessimistic, uh, looking at the, the state of the Bitcoin ecosystem. And over the past six months or so, I think it's uh, been nice to see some improvements coming along. So. You know, I was talking a lot about ossification earlier in the year. Uh, we're still going to be talking about it. I think it's going to be an ongoing thing because, you know, ossification is this natural consequence of network protocols. We've seen a variety of network protocols over the years, whether it's TCP uh, at, at the very low layers of the internet stack that we're all using every day, to SMTP, the email protocol. It seems to be almost a, a rule of physics. Basically, you're creating a protocol. It's a way to communicate with other people around the world. So we have a common language. But if we want to keep changing that language because we want to make it better, we want to fix things, we run the risk of breaking it. And if you, if you break that language so that you're no longer able to talk to each other over this common protocol, uh, you're, you're running the risk of destroying the network effects of that protocol. So essentially, what happens is these networks continue to grow around this shared language, and they eventually get crushed under the weight of the size of the network uh, versus the ability to change it without breaking that network effect. So as of today, you know, these low-level internet protocols have not changed in 10, 15, 20 years. And by no means is that because the protocols are perfect. In fact, you talk to any of the wizards at the Internet Engineering Task Force who worked on the, the early TCP IP stack, they would tell you that one of their greatest disappointments is that encryption was not developed into the lowest layers of the Internet. So what ended up happening, it had to be bolted on at higher layers, and it was not a default. So there you know, are many people that are using internet-based protocols, and they're not using encryption to protect uh, whatever communications are happening. This is something that I think we want to avoid as much as we can uh, to happen with Bitcoin. And you know, in particular, I like to talk about SMTP. And that's because I was an email engineer for the first decade of my career. I got to see the inner workings of this uh, protocol. And SMTP, if you actually look at the protocol, it's a fairly straightforward back and forth you know, between client and server, uh, two different machines that want to talk to each other. And in the early days, this was how email worked. You could start up a server, you could follow the rules of this protocol, and you could be highly guaranteed that whoever you were talking to on the other end would receive the message and that it would you know, eventually get to its destination. But over the decades, we saw the network change. We saw mass adoption happen as you know, AOL came in and millions of people started joining the internet. And of course, naughty people started using this protocol and abusing it and sending large amounts of spam. And this was something that my own company had to deal with uh, a lot when I was there because we were trying to send 100 million emails a day on behalf of our clients, and we had to very carefully navigate a lot of the tricky rules of the ecosystem around uh, spam and blacklisting. And basically what went wrong with email is that one of the original assumptions of the people who designed SMTP was that we want to ensure delivery. And the assumption was that you would want to receive the emails that people were sending to you. That was true for many years, but that changed. And as that changed, the rest of the ecosystem had to figure out how to adapt. So we went through many different phases. One of the early phases was using something called uh, Bayesian filters, basically like looking for keywords, looking for spammy occurrences of words and characters that were uh, generally seen in spammy emails. This was very crude. It ended up with a lot of false positives, and it was eventually abandoned after several years. What happened? Uh, we started trying all of these other new things. Um, we, we started uh, creating much more complex systems on the back end. And 
it worked a little bit better, but still, you know, this was mostly trying to look at content. It was trying to classify content as being good or bad. And so it was a, a never-ending battle of the spammers always trying to find ways around these filters. So what happened? We ended up settling on something called reputation. Rather than looking and trying to judge the content of the messages, we started judging the actual uh, entities that were sending the, the content. And you know, this led to a proliferation of dozens of different companies that did nothing except try to uh, come up with reputation scores. You may have heard of things like sender policy framework, sender ID, domain keys, the list goes on and on. Uh, my own company is, is there, uh, Bronto Software, right in the middle, and we were trying to navigate this whole complex ecosystem to ensure that our customers' emails were getting to where they wanted. But if you're familiar with how any of these technologies work, they are highly centralized. They have gatekeepers that assign things like domains and IP addresses and uh, actually create blacklists that you then have to go beg to get yourself off of if you accidentally end up on one of them. And you know, the fatal flaw to this particular solution is that um, it was highly centralized and it created this really monstrous meta protocol on top of actual SMTP. One of the other problems that happened is that this imposed a great cost upon people who wanted to navigate this system. Like I said, I was working for a big company. We had a lot of money and engineers and people who could help with the reputation stuff, but that caused even more centralization. So you know, where are we today? 90% of quote-unquote email users are captured by five companies. And this centralization, it ended up producing non-economic solutions to spam. And today's email servers will tell you that they're accepting an email at the protocol level, but in many cases, they will just black hole it. Uh, they, they won't tell you that it actually went into a spam folder or it just got silently dropped. So, the short version is that SMTP as a protocol, the ability for any of us to follow this protocol and be able to communicate with people using the network is pretty much dead. Um, you, you cannot actually be sure that your message is going to get to where it's supposed to go. So sure, email is mass adopted, billions of people are using it. Could you say that email works? Yeah, but at what cost? At a great cost that I think few people even realize are being pay, um, paid on a day-by-day -day basis. Essentially, you're having to ask permission and you know, hope that these companies will allow you to use the protocol. And you know, the, the downside is that one of the prices we pay is our information. You know, many of us, probably most of us, are not you know, paying money to use our email provider. Rather, we're allowing these email providers to harvest all of our data, you know, use it for their own purposes. Did it have to be this way? I would say no. Uh, there was actually a proposal back in the 90s by this guy called Adam Back. And it came up with something called Hashcash using this concept called proof of work. The idea being that instead of having a few centralized gatekeepers doing filtering and reputation, you just have whoever wants to use the protocol spin their CPU for some amount of time to prove that they had put you know, some computational effort into it. You know, this was a decentralized solution. It, it imposed an economic cost upon sending email that was supposed to make you know, sending high volumes of spam uh, computationally prohibited. But for a variety of reasons, that uh, didn't actually get implemented. So how does this all relate to, to Bitcoin? Well, we see a, a movement of some people in the Bitcoin ecosystem that say, uh, we should actually want to ossify the protocol. We need to do that uh, because it ensures that the protocol remains as it is today, which we know is in a good and working state. That's a decent argument. Uh, there's also people who are worried about changes that could happen that might make the protocol weaker. 
Uh, this is true of all software development. Whenever you make a change to software, you might be making it better, but there's always a risk that you may be making it worse in some way. Uh, this is you know, sort of law of unintended consequences. Like There will always be unknown unknowns. That's true if you make changes, but I would also say there are unknown unknowns if you don't make changes to the protocols. And, and this, I think, is really exhibited well if we look at SMTP or we look at uh, you know, the lack of encryption at low layers of the internet. Basically, you can ossify a protocol. You cannot ossify the rest of the world. The rest of the world will continue to change. New unforeseen problems will arise. People will demand solutions. The question becomes, how do the solutions get implemented? If you can't implement them at the protocol itself, they will be bolted on somehow else. And the unfortunate nature of most software design and of, I would say, you know, human nature in general is to uh, default to the more naive and straightforward centralized solutions that end up uh, creating gatekeepers in these ecosystems. So there are risks if we don't uh, allow some flexibility, then we cannot improve the protocol and people have to figure out hackier solutions for how to achieve new functionality, how to uh, solve problems that are, are coming in from unforeseen vectors. So we have to be aware that not changing the protocol can still result in the protocol changing, but at higher levels, basically, this, this meta protocol. Point being, as I said, you can get onto the internet today, you can follow SMTP to the letter, to the spec, and your email doesn't get delivered. I would, I would pose to you that means that SMTP as a protocol is broken. Uh, people who are actually using email would tell you, no, there's just a lot of other rules that uh, you have to follow and they just aren't in the spec. And so I think this would be a disaster if this happened to Bitcoin. We definitely want to avoid that. Now, we can somewhat quantify the level of innovation happening in this space. This is from a report last year. I thought it was interesting that nearly 30% of all development, according to the way they quantify it, was happening in Bitcoin and Ethereum. More concerning, though, you can barely see Bitcoin at the bottom there in the orange. Um, it, it only seems to be maybe 20% of the sort of size and velocity of Ethereum development. Uh, I think it's not controversial to say that Ethereum has a more diverse developer ecosystem. This, of course, is due to a number of different reasons. Uh, you know, more uh, <clears throat> flexibility and functionality and programmability, uh, more tool sets that have been built up and let people experiment in different ways. But I'm optimistic. Now, these are just some of the hackathons and accelerators that I have come across this year. Now, I'm sure there are many more that I'm not even aware of, but compared to previous years, it seems like we are seeing some acceleration in development in the Bitcoin ecosystem. So I'm optimistic. Uh, we, we are seeing more functionality, more applications, and as Muneeb said, more second layers uh, being developed. I think we need to do this for scaling reasons. I think that uh, side chains and layer twos, as Muneeb was saying, are one of the most important things that we can have happen in this ecosystem because this is how we really enable permissionless innovation. I think it's not controversial to say that ossification will happen. As I said, it's, it's almost a fundamental rule of networks. And so we want people to be able to innovate on related but different protocols to Bitcoin so that we're not having to constantly fight over changing the base protocol. We can look at things like side chains, uh, whether it's like liquid or root stock. These have kind of stalled out from a number of different metrics, uh, but also uh, they are not totally permissionless. Uh, they tend to be based around federations. Uh, perhaps that's one of the reasons uh, why they haven't gotten a, a great level of adoption. Uh, but we do have other sidechain proposals out there. 
Drive chains, uh, currently a lot of uh, debate happening around that. Spider chain, fairly new concept that was just uh, announced about a month ago, which actually requires no changes to the Bitcoin protocol. It's a new way of pegging second layers uh, to Bitcoin. Uh, there's even something that was just announced last week, and they haven't even released all the details, but this uh, radiant trustless two-way peg. Um, and then we've also seen things like BitVM uh, just announced in the past week or two that have you know, potential for enabling a massive amount of permissionless innovation happening because they don't require changes to Bitcoin itself. Covenants are another interesting uh, primitive that I think Bitcoin could really benefit from. What is a covenant? It basically means the ability to place restrictions on the future flow of money through the system. Now this right here looks really complicated, and it is, because the only way that you can really do covenants right now involves pre-signing a ton of transactions to restrict what's happening with the Bitcoin. Basically, nobody does that. It's really onerous. It's very brittle. Uh, developers don't want to have to deal with this level of complexity. We have actually a uh, minimal covenant proposal called Op Vault that allows you to do some restrictions on the flow of funds, basically giving you the ability to take your money back if it's taken from you without your permission, uh, if you put it into one of these vaults. I find that very interesting uh, as a security professional because this actually enables a completely different type of security. Instead of only having upfront security, and if someone penetrates your security, you have a catastrophic loss, now you can actually react to security failures. So how do we prevent ossification? At a network protocol level, there's a number of ways to do that. Unfortunately, encryption isn't really an option for us because Bitcoin is an open, transparent system. Uh, there's extensions that are used in protocols. I would say the closest thing that is is basically uh, changing opcodes within Bitcoin. As we've seen, that's very difficult to do, but it is possible. I really think that uh, things like sidechains and rollups are the solution. Now, the problem is that we most likely need A to get B and C. Uh, we need some small changes to the Bitcoin protocol to really allow uh, the permissionless innovation to bloom within this ecosystem. The other thing is just velocity, and I think that's also one reason why I'm optimistic. As I said, I'm seeing so many more hackathons, so many more developers uh, coming in from other ecosystems or just you know, from outside of the, the whole crypto ecosystem because they're seeing the ability to build more uh, functionality, do new things on top of Bitcoin. So you know, I don't advocate for any uh, one specific thing. I think we need everything. Historically, we can, we can look at stuff like, okay, what, what would have happened if we had ossified protocol uh, in 2015? If we didn't have uh, check lock time verify, we wouldn't be able to have lightning network channels. If we didn't have check sequence verify, lightning network channels would not be able to stay open indefinitely. Without segregated witness, we'd still have a lot of transaction malleability problems that would have prevented lightning and other second layer networks. Without Taproot, we wouldn't have Taproot assets, which uh, were just you know, officially released, I think, yesterday. So you know, we need to keep allowing new functionality to happen uh, because it can have a order of magnitude multiplier effect of what people are able to do on these other layers. If, if we don't enable that, then It'll either be people doing really hacky stuff or just you know, choosing completely different protocols that may be you know, competing networks with Bitcoin. So uh, not any one thing I propose. I want all of the things. I want the experimentation to keep happening. I think this is, the only way forward is to continue building, failing, learning from the failures, and, uh, and evolving. And so, you know, ossification is going to happen, but we need to keep racing forward and get as far as we can uh, before it ac actually happens. So, permissionless innovation, developers, developers, developers. If we allow the developers to innovate, I think they will come. So, we'll continue building, and uh, I'll be here to continue talking about all the great things that Bitcoin and its ecosystem can do. Thank you.